So the biggest danger in comparison is that you don't recognize who God's made you to be. And when you don't walk in what God, who God has made you, you try to become somebody else, and then you're not doing what God's called you to do. Now, as we talk about comparison today, one of the things I want you to know is there are times that comparison is good, believe it or not. Um, you might get around a friend who was chubby, and all of a sudden you get around them, and they start eating a little better, and you start looking at them, and you start thinking, they're losing weight. I could do that. <laughs> right. If they can do that, I can do that. You might get around a couple who has a good marriage and you think, you know, there's some things I need to work on in my marriage. You might get around somebody who spiritually is growing. And as you get around them, that flicker of flame in your life catches fire again because you said, you know, I really want God to do that in my life. But most of the time, for most of us, comparison is a negative harmful trait that really destroys us. And oftentimes, it's because we don't understand our value, who God has made us to be. So this is a bottle of water. Um, let me just give you some different places, and you tell me what you would pay for this bottle of water, okay? We're going to start We're gonna start with the simplest one, okay? Aldi. What would you pay for this bottle of water at Aldi? 50 cents. Okay, that's good. You're doing good. Okay, we're going to help you out. All right, now you go to Publix. What are you going to pay for this bottle of water? 75, 75 to a dollar, right? Right in there. All right. Then you're going to play golf and you run into the shop in between while you're dying of thirst. How much are they going to charge you for this water? About five bucks. Okay. So then now, now we're just going to jump to the end. You ready? Then you go to Disney World. What do they charge you for this water? Ten bucks for water, right? Yeah, because they don't want to break an eight. So, so here's the thing. By the way, Disney World this weekend was selling a popcorn bucket, popcorn bucket, ready, ready, for $25. It's already selling on eBay for $150. Do you think things have different? It's a figment popcorn bucket. I wouldn't mind one, but I ain't paying no $150 bucks for it. Um, people waited three hours in line. Now, here's what you and I need to know. You may have grown up in a home where you had Aldi parents. Now, there's nothing wrong with Aldi itself. Don't, don't hear me in the wrong way. I love Aldi. It's a great place. But they may have devalued you, told you that you weren't important, you didn't matter. And so you've grown up in the back of your mind saying that. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was somebody in your life that said, you're not valuable. And here's what you and I don't recognize. When the Bible says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus... What that means is God was willing, you ready, to pay everything for you. You, you were that valuable to him that he gave everything for you. And when we devalue what God's made us, or when we think we're Publix Christians and they're Aldi Christians, <laughs> we, we miss out. On what God really is trying to show us, which is he has created each of you valuable and special. But it's not something new. It happened way back in Genesis. And we're going to look at three stories. Two of them are related from thousands of years ago. And we're going to talk about how wrong comparison leads to misery, <laughs> anger, and hatred. By the way, if you want to ruin your joy, compare. I had a guy after church said, Eric, it's amazing you told that story because I was out fishing yesterday and I wasn't catching any fish and the guy in the boat next to me caught a fish. And he said, you know, at first I got jealous and then I realized, oh, I just need to go over there and look for fish. <laughs> so that's what he did. He caught 25. So number one, comparison leads to misery. Now we're going to look at the story of Jacob who later becomes Israel. This, these kids in this story are the uh, children of Israel. These are the ones that all the tribes are named after. And we're just going to pick up in Genesis 29. But I encourage you if, you, if you want to really get some out of this message, you read some of the backstory. Two things will happen. Number one is you'll realize how dangerous jealousy is. Number two is you'll realize if God can use people that are this broken, then he can use me. Because we're going to look at these stories. These are people who are considered heroes of the Bible, and they're very defective. By the way, when you're defective, God still values you. So don't forget that. It doesn't mean he doesn't want you to repent, but, but here it is. All right. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved. Time out. We're talking about Princess Leah here. All right. Time out. So, so here's the thing. 
So Jacob wants to marry Rachel. But the dad tricks him and gives him Rachel after seven years of work for her. Okay? Because he, excuse me, tricks her and gives her Leah. He wanted Rachel and ends up with Leah. So then he says to the dad afterwards, you tricked me, which is funny because he was a trickster. His name literally means heel grabber. How's that for a great name growing up? Hello, heel grabber. He Remember he tricks his brother with Jacob and Esau. Remember that story? He, he trades in his birthright for stew and all that happens. And he tricks his dad by putting hairy stuff on his arms. And, and now he's tricked and he can't take it. So he says, hey, I want your other daughter. He says, okay, work another seven years. So he agrees to work another seven years, and in that first week, he gives him Rachel. Well, you can imagine how Leah's feeling about this time. It kind of messes with your self-esteem when somebody says, uh, yeah, I married her, but that's not who I want. I want this other person. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, listen, but Rachel, the, the pretty one, right, the one he wanted, remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to her son. She named him Reuben, which literally means, you ready? It's a boy. What's your name? It's a boy. What's your name? He'll grab her. These are some weird people. Now, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to read the rest of this because to me, one of the saddest sentences in Scripture is coming up. It's because the Lord has seen my misery. Then she says this, surely my husband will love me now. Listen, if you think that your value is only in what you do for somebody, you, you are headed down a very bad path. If you think that doing something for somebody is going to make them love you more, and if they really do love you more when you do what they want, you are in a bad relationship. There are people right now sacrificing their purity, because they think if I do, somebody will love me. There are people sacrificing their morals because they think if I do, somebody will love me and even maybe like me more. Because they don't understand how valuable they are in themselves and they're so busy trying to get love from a person instead of from God because they think they're not valuable. So they're shopping at every store looking for value and when you have to try to earn your love this way, you're never going to earn it. And all you're going to do is become exasperated and frustrated. But if you think she's the only one that's miserable, it continues. When Rachel saw, verse thir chapter 30, verse 1, that she was not bearing Jacob any children, listen, she became jealous of her sister. Now, you would think she would be like, I'm the one who he worked 14 years for. You think that would help your self-esteem a touch. You think you would understand your value, but here's the deal. When you put your value in something, you're always looking for more or different. And so she's always looking for what she doesn't have. I, you know, I didn't know I was short. Till my brother outgrew me and let me know. He still lets me know to this day sometimes. He'll stand next to me and say something about me being short. And I always tell him, number one, I fit in planes better, small cars better. And then I have to throw this one in because we're brothers. And I'm nice. He's a pastor too, by the way. So she became jealous of his sister. And what happened? She lost her mind. How do I know that? Because listen to what she says next. She said to Jacob, give me children or I will die. Now you think, well, this was thousands of years ago. People are just not that smart. Hey, have you ever had a three-year-old or a two-year-old in a grocery store and gone to that aisle that has all the stuff they want? Or maybe you're in Walmart and there's the teddy bears and they let you know, if they don't get that, they're going to die. And they really think they're going to die. And there's a time that you might be willing to give them whatever they want because you feel like you're going to die, right? By the way, if you always give them what they want, they'll never figure out that they're not going to die. But that's another story for another day. So she says, give it or I'll die. Jacob became angry with her. Am I in the place of God who's been kept you from having children? It gets worse. 
She thinks, well, I can't get what I want myself, so I'll just work around it. Here we go. Here, here's Bill and my servant. Sleep with her. She can bear children for me, and I can build a family through her. How many people think this is going to go well? And we look at this story from thousands of years out, and we say, gosh, how dumb they are. But how many times do people go into debt thinking, this car can parallel park? I mean, I have to parallel park at least once a year. I need that car. I just got enough cup holders. You know, I spilled coffee on myself last week because I didn't have enough cup holders. Right? I need this bigger house. I need this. I need to have everything my parents had when I'm 20, even though they're 80 (laughs) or 50. Because we think, if I don't have this, I'm going to die. So we're willing to sacrifice our future to be satisfied in the present. Did you hear me? Don't sacrifice your future just to be satisfied in the present. Don't get in a hurry because jealousy leads to misery. And misery will make you do things you didn't mean to do and make you make decisions you didn't mean to make. You'll be irrational emotionally because you'll think, I got to have this. Listen, when you're at a car dealership and you feel that pressure, that's the I'm going to die pressure. When you're looking at that new grill online, the bottom fell out of mine this week. I don't know why I'm turning pages because you don't do that online, but here we go. I feel like I'm back in the Sears catalog, remember? Need a new grill. $600, what are these people smoking? What in the world? I guess I'm cooking on the stove for a while, right? Oh, that one looks good. If I don't have that egg, I might die. When you start feeling that urge, recognize what's really going on. You're becoming irrational. Here's some disconnection habits. And I want, I want to, every week I'm going to give you just some little habits. You're miserable when you compare. By the way, if you want to lose your joy, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt said, if you want to lose all your joy, just compare. I bought tickets to a concert a few weeks ago. Like 10th row. I was so excited. And I told somebody in our church, I got 10th row tickets to this concert. And they said, well, we'll wave to you from the front. We've got third row tickets. Anybody want to buy some tickets to a concert? Miserable in comparison. Jealousy. An irrational need. We do this when we want things especially, but also when we want love. Some of you weren't loved as kids and you just need to realize that you're not a kid anymore. That parent no longer, their opinion of your value is no longer with you, but your value opinion is with you. So you need to get past it and take God's opinion of you. Irrational. Poor decisions. Boy, we make dumb decisions when we're in a hurry, when we feel lack, when it feels like we need more. Here's some connecting habits. Grateful for what you have. You can be in a one-bedroom shack with beans and be content, and you can be in a mansion full of people and be discontent. It's not what you have, it's how you respond. You can be happy for others. Are you really happy for others? By the way, being happy for others is not normal for us. But you know what else isn't normal for us? Brushing our teeth. If you have children, and if you have teenagers, putting on deodorant, you find out, is not natural for boys, right? But what do you do? You teach them, and then they meet a girl, and all of a sudden, you don't have to teach them. You have to tell them, don't put on so much, whatever you put on, right? Brushing teeth, now you do it all the time. You don't even think about it. It's become a habit. What was unnatural became natural. You know, being happy for others can become natural as you practice it. So that means the first time somebody comes up and goes, hey, I got a raise, and you work at the same job, that's great. Congratulations. And then you go home and go, Lord, would you help me to really be happy for them? Fulfilled by God. Give me children or I will die. God, whatever you want me to have, I'll have. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Fulfilled by God. And then finally, wisdom. Can we make wise decisions? Why? Because God created you to accomplish what only you can accomplish. And when you're desiring to be somebody else, you can't accomplish those things. Number two, comparison leads to anger. Now, we're going to go way back, and I'm just going to do this story quickly. You should know the story. Cain and Abel. Okay? And remember, the one brother raised sheep. Cain raised vegetables. God wanted sheep as a sacrifice. So he would have had to go and trade tomatoes for sheep, I guess. I don't know. He would have to humble himself and go to his brother and say, hey, can I trade you some of this for that? But he just didn't want to do what he was told. And so God comes to him and says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you want 
If you do what's right, you'll be accepted. But if you don't do what's right, listen to this. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but it mu you must rule over it. Listen, jealousy and anger do that. They crouch at the door. You don't think they're a big deal until you're overwhelmed with them. We all know somebody who's let their anger destroy their lives. They've let their anger destroy their family. They've let their anger cause them to say things they shouldn't say to people and hurt people in their lives. We've all done it. We've allowed anger to make us... Oh, but if it becomes a habit, hey, sin is always crouching at the door. And then he continues. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he was probably a teenager, so he said, oh. He replied, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you're under a curse. And driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Now you think, I would never kill somebody. Yeah, but do you let anger overtake you? We all know somebody who's destroyed their own lives and even hurt other people, even though they've not done anything illegal through their anger. Anger oftentimes comes out of jealousy. There's a pastor who told a story about he and his sister. They had about the same birthday, and every year grandma would send him 20 bucks. And a check. And so every year, the pastor would open his, his envelope the same time his sister did, and his sister would say, $20. And the pastor would say, $100 lied to his sister. And she would go to her room crying, Oh, well, Grandma found out when they were teenagers that he had been doing this year after year. So you know what Grandma did already, don't you? Grandma wrote her a check for $100 and wrote him a check for $20. So they go to open their checks. He opens it as usual and says, $100. And she opens hers and goes, oh, $100 and shows the brother the check. So he runs to his room crying. See, we're so busy comparing sometimes and thinking who loves me more that we don't understand it's not a competition. God gave everything for each of you. You're not in competition with that per person that you think is prettier or smarter or faster. God created you to be you, to use the gifts you have to be a blessing. You can't be someone else. You've got to be who God made you to be. So listen to some disconnection habits from the story of Cain and Abel. Here they are. Wrong choices lead to sin. And of course, we all know anger and what it does is very destructive. By the way, some of your anger is against you because somebody told you you weren't valuable and you haven't figured it out yet. Refusal to change. <laughs> we love to think we're right. Pride and attacking others. Do you know why people gossip about other people? Because they forgot their value. And maybe they forgot the value of the other person too. Because when you recognize that we're all valuable, you don't need to talk bad about someone else. Because you recognize that they're valuable too. And then repentance. God, I know who I am. Repentance, we always see as this negative thing. But repentance is just a change of mind. Some of you need to repent from thinking that you don't matter. Some of you need to repent from thinking you need to be taller or smarter or prettier or handsomer. It's not a word. Whatever er you think, right? Repentance. Releasing control. See, what God said to him was, hey, you need to do this. And he said, I don't want to do that. A lot of times we don't want to do what God wants us to do. Why? Because it's not comfortable. We got to look at steps to change. We have to... Do humility and acceptance. By the way, if you ever join AA, you'll see all these steps right there. Number three, comparison leads to hatred. Especially if your water bottle is not half full. <laughs> because no matter who you reach out to or try to get something from them, it's never enough. So we've got the story we told earlier. They have a bunch of kids. And then the pretty woman dies. She has two kids. Some guy named Joseph. You may have heard of him. Joseph's dad was such a doofus that he liked Joseph so much more that he let all the brothers and all the stepbrothers know it. That's always not a good place to start. This is a very dysfunctional family. So here's what happens. Israel, who we know is Jacob, heel grabber, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. By the way, some of you grew up that way. It's time to get over it. Because he had been born in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Listen, when your eyes are on other people, you will never be fulfilled and you will never feel good enough. 
But when you understand how much God loves you, you'll begin to recognize who he's made you to be. But Eric, I wish I was like that. No, you don't. Because you've brought something to the world that no one else has. So don't sacrifice that. Joseph knew this. Joseph's brothers threw him in a pit. He's dragged off to Egypt. He goes to Egypt, and I believe Joseph's already forgiven his brothers because he said, you know what? God brought me here for a reason. Regardless of what they did, God allowed me to be here. So he just started obeying God, and you know what happened? He got thrown in jail. What? I thought when you obeyed God, everything went well. <laughs> See, he obeyed God and gets thrown in jail. And you know what he does in jail? He mopes and gets mad and says, I can't believe my brothers. They're back home. No, he doesn't. You know what he does? He says, God, I'm here in jail. What do you want me to do? And you know what happens to him in jail? He gets promoted. He gets promoted in jail, and then finally he gets dragged out of jail to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh's like, huh, you're pretty smart. I wonder if there's somebody smart who could run my kingdom. Joseph's like, that's a great idea. You should have somebody smart do it. You know, somebody who maybe can interpret dreams. He becomes second in all the land. And then his brothers run out of food and come to visit. Now, I don't know about you, but most of us would sound like this. <laughs> right? By then, we would have the big chair and a, a cat with no fur. Hello. By the way, they did have those cats. Somebody in our church raises the Egyptian cats. So it could be that Joseph, as his brothers came in, went, hello. So the brothers come in, and here's what happens. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. Now, I realize there were probably people in swords next to him. Joseph's wearing makeup, head is shaved, he's all tan and good looking, sitting on a throne. He's got kids, he's got a wife, he's got people going, yes sir, yes sir, whatever you need, whatever you need. He's speaking in a foreign language, and then he speaks to his brothers, and they recognize his voice. Because now he's speaking their language. He's pretended he didn't know them. He says, come closer to me, which would have been terrifying. When they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. I'm thinking bodily functions were an issue right now, but we're not going to talk about that. All right. And now, do, did I say that out loud? That meant to stay. This is second service. Okay. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Why? Because it was to save lives God sent me ahead of you. And then, a verse later, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Listen. No matter where he was, he didn't look at what he didn't have. He didn't look where he could have been. He didn't look at what he could have been doing. He said, God, I'm here. What do you want me to do here? God's made you who you are. Whether you have a physical issue, a mental issue, an emotional issue, God's allowed all those things to make you who you are. And even in your weakness and struggle and suffering, he can use that, what? To do what Joseph did. To help other people. To find their way home. I want you to look at disconnection and connection, then I want to tell an embarrassing story I've never told all the years I've been a pastor. Disconnection habits, hatred... Entitlement, exclusion, attacking others. That could be gossip. Could be just looking for ways to undermine them. Connecting habits, love, forgiveness, empathy, inclusion, and trusting God's plan. On the way to church this morning, I thought of this story. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to share it. Years ago, when I was in my 20s, most of you know I was a pretty good drummer in my 20s, to the point that they asked me to play on cruise ships, I was asked to tour. And there was a church I was at where there was actually a drummer who had toured and who had played in concerts for years and had played in studios, and he was really good. And whenever they were doing a really good song or a really good production or if they had guests coming in that were important, I didn't get to play drums. He did. And so one day I called the music pastor and I said, I'm not playing anymore. And so he wanted to meet with me and talk to me, so we talked a little bit. What came out of that conversation was very simply, that drummer's better than you. And here's what I had to decide. Am I going to do God's will? Or am I going to be jealous and say, I'm not doing that anymore? And so I decided to keep playing. Not only did I keep playing, guess what? I started learning from that other drummer. 
I learned new ways to play, new, way, new things that matter when you're playing Christian music, ways to play the cymbals, other things that he did that I would have never learned if I hadn't paid attention. Year after year, he was patient with me. If it hadn't been for that, it wouldn't have been the next step in my journey was to go and be a youth pastor at a church. And that music pastor and the pastor of that church encouraged me to do that. And then a few years later, they called me back and said, we want you to come back and be our youth pastor. And then when I went to plant a church, that church helped sponsor me so I could help plant a church that then made a difference in the community. And that's one of the reasons I'm here today. See, you never know with the hurts and the jealousy and the comparison that are going on in your life, if you allow that to stop you from doing God's will, it may keep you from the next step on the journey God has for you. But if you'll humble yourself, if you'll quit comparing and be grateful for other people and look for opportunities to be thankful for them and even say, I can learn from them, then the very thing that messes with your pride may be the very thing that God uses to take you... To on the journey he wants you to have. To then impact hundreds and even thousands of other people's lives because of your story. Because of your suffering and struggle. And it's okay. If you're here today or watching online and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Listen, the Bible says that Jesus came and died for you. He gave everything for you. You are the most valuable thing God could think of. And so he sacrificed Jesus for you. Jesus came and died and rose again. To pay for our sins because we're messed up and broken. We can't even talk to God without his help. But that's why Jesus came. So if you're here today and you're ready to surrender your life to him. That's what it means to be his disciple. And I'd love to talk to you about after the service. About what it means to know him and walk with him. If you're here today and as I was talking you realize you struggle with comparison. Maybe gossip. Maybe some of those things I talked about. Hey, it's okay. We're all on this journey together. Confess. Make it right. And walk on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for your word, your strength, your power, your love for us. Thank you that even while we fail, you still love us. Lord, even when we compare, Lord, even those days that we go out of our way to compare ourselves with other people, Father, that you love us in the middle of that and you're patient with us. Lord, thank you for your grace and your love for us. May we walk in that grace today knowing that our value is so precious in your sight. Lord, the value that we've been given by other people, I pray we could put that aside and understand the value you've given us and not compare, but celebrate with others. In Jesus' name, amen.